The French poet Baudelaire, Charles Baudelaire, defended makeup. He has an essay called the In Praise of Makeup. Uh, and so I'm talking about the cultivation of the superficial surface and image, which is a performance. And as this is a new way of thinking about creating art in the modern world that's positive. I mean, because it can be negative, where things can just be superficial in a negative way. But Wilde and Tolkien and some of these other figures that I'm quoting are going to defend and make use of the surface. So Baudelaire, in the middle 1800s, was writing uh, this. He said, woman is well within her rights and even fulfilling a kind of duty in devoting herself to the task of fostering a magic and supernatural aura about her appearance. And, and in this essay called In Praise of Makeup, he says that makeup uh, immediately approximates the human being to a statue. In other words, a divine or superior being. Uh, it's, it's evincing this supernatural, excessive life. Um, this could sound really negative, and some people would see this as just like superficial and fake and performing something that's not real. But what Wilde is doing and what I'm trying to do is to tease out this positive vision of modern art in the modern world that's totally evolved with consumer culture, with commercialization. It's not separate from that. We, we tend to see art as like, it's either in the museum where it's kind of sanctified and kept separate from the commercial world, or it's in the mall where it's kind of dirtied up and made ruined and corrupted by the commercial world. And Wilde is just merging that all together. And um, at to some extent, Tolkien in a, di in a slightly different way. So let's go through this um, and let's talk about this in terms of Weber, Max Weber, German philosopher, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, also a politician. Um, so his, his philosophy is kind of involved in like the political world actually. And in this essay, I guess it was a lecture originally called Science as a Vocation. He says something here that I'm going to show you if I can get this thing to work. Da, 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 da. Let's go to Word. And Weber says, the savage knows what he does in order to get his daily food and which institutions serve him in this pursuit. Savage is not a nice word, but that's the word, I mean, for someone who's not from a civilized country. Uh, I'm not going to get into that, that's complicated. Hence, it means that principally there are no mysterious, incalculable forces that come into play, but rather that one can, in principle, master all things by calculation. So, pausing there for a second, Weber is contrasting the modern civilized world where everything's calculated, everything's empirically, experimentally verified and measured and that's what's true and, and and sure and and that's a contrast to what he's calling the savage people who are sort of pre-modern and then he says this means that the world is disenchanted keyword disenchanted one need no longer have recourse to magical means in order to master or improve implore the spirits as did the savage for whom such mysterious powers existed Technical means and calculations perform the service. This, above all, is what intellectualization means. And so, like, I was just rereading re parts of the Iliad, for example, the ancient Greek story, the Iliad, about Achilles and Achilles' wrath and these great heroic Greek soldiers. And when they're getting ready for battle, they do sacrifices. They do these hecatombs. A hecatomb, heca means a hundred and they would kill a hundred bulls, and sometimes it wasn't actually a hundred of them, but a large number of bulls, and then sacrifice them to the gods or to Jupiter or to Mars or Ares in order to get 
a good battle going and um, please the gods. And so what Weber is saying is like, now we've gotten rid of that idea. And now the world is disenchanted. And so this is kind of like, let me just start with this. This is the idea. This is modern world. It's disenchanted. These types of spiritual realities, uh, we've kind of, uh, and I, I myself, I don't believe in killing a bunch of bulls to, to, to do well in a war. Um, uh, I'll, I'll leave aside my own religious beliefs at the moment. But yeah, no, I, we don't need to believe in that. But what people like Wilde and Tolkien are doing is that they're re-enchanting, in some sense, the world, or maybe they're saying the world was never totally disenchanted to begin with, actually, because of things like consumer culture. Um, and uh, if people like Weber or T.S. Eliot or Wendell Berry see modern consumerism as, as kind of like flattening and disenchanting the world and taking away a kind of connection to things transcendent, to things of, of in, eternal or, or more enduring value. Tolkien and, and Wilde are doing something different. They're giving a, an alternative mode of consumer culture artwork. Tolkien with his massively popular and commercial su su commercially successful works and wild kind of theorizing consumer aesthetics, consumer artwork, re-enchanted through the commercialized society. And in one of his essays, Wilde gets at this, I mean, it, it's very piecemeal, so I'm trying to like pull together Wilde's work. I mean, he died at the young age of 45, which is younger than me. So he never was able to total, totally develop his, his theory into a coherent, big, well-developed theory. So I'm trying to do that work for him. And we're going into some of his essays. And one of his essays is called The Critic as Artist. You know, critics are generally considered the opposite of artists. The artist creates the work, the critic looks at the work and analyzes it. And while saying like, no, actually the critic and the artist are actually both the same person. Or the critic himself is actually more of an artist than the artist. Um, anyway, and in this quote that I'm going to show you, Wilde says, uh, talking about a beautiful painting or a beautiful story, uh, let's say uh, a beautiful painting like uh, the Mona Lisa or um, uh, something by uh, Van Gogh, his, his Van Gogh's uh, self-portrait with his ear cut off, if you've seen that. You know, here's what Wilde says. He says, then life becomes fascinated with this new wonder and asks to be re admitted into the charmed circle. Art takes life as part of her rough material, recreates it, and refashions it in fresh forms. See, so here's a kind of a re-enchantment where the work of art, let's say the Mona Lisa, it takes uh, life, a, a woman, and it, it creates this stylized, beautiful image of the woman, the painting. You know, Leonardo does that. And then life, meaning us, us people, look at that painting, and we become fascinated with a new wonder. And, and that's what art does. It allows us to see anew, to see with wonder, to, to have the world open up to us, including its transcendent value. And then life, meaning you and me, ask to be admitted into the charmed circle. We want to become like that. We, we start to imitate that. We start to be influenced by that. We start to be inspired by that. And some people even start to cultivate a look that looks like that painting of that woman. Art takes life as part of her rough material, recreates it, and refreshes it in, in, in fresh forms. So art is influencing me and you, life, and, and, then, and it's refashioning us. It's, and so there's this dialectic where like, the artist creates the artwork, and the artwork kind of recreates me, and I sort of become an imitator and someone who's inspired by that artwork. And there's this kind of ongoing dialectic and creation and reflection and stylization and and wonder and because beauty allows us to see the world anew and to see it more completely when we're looking at the world and we don't see its beauty we're not seeing it we're not seeing it completely the world is wonderful in a certain sense I mean it's beautiful it's got this meaning that it's that it's drawing from 
within my heart and my mind and my body. Um, and that's the proper work of the philosopher, the philosopher who uh, you know, loves wisdom. They don't just like look at wisdom, but we desire wisdom. We, we love it. We wonder at it. Anyway, a lot of ideas there. Um, and so this is a re-enchantment by Wilde. Critic is artist. And, you know, this is against the concept of the, dis the disenchantment, or it's going beyond the concept of disenchantment, which we looked at earlier. Because disenchantment says what? It says that those enchantments were lies. They were false. Killing those bulls, that's a lie. Don't, don't waste your time. It's not going to do anything. And, and there's, that's true. I mean, I'm not going to kill all those bulls. But if you take the disenchantment too far, then, then, then you just close off the possibility of, of any kind of wonder, of any kind of ins being, being inspired by the beauty of the art, by the beauty of nature. Um, and, I mean, the reality is w there was never a full disenchantment of culture. I mean, because we've always, uh, even Weber, uh, we're, we're inspired... Um, by the environment, by uh, the desire for freedom. I mean, uh, uh, Weber himself was a political theorist, and he, he saw, like, yes, uh, there's this desire for freedom and an increase of freedom and liberty that is a really true transcendent value that we're working out in the world. It's not completely flattened by this disenchantment. Um, but in any case, what I want to focus on is that the disenchantment did largely win, that we're still, here we are in the 21st century, in that disenchanted world where there's a generalized, even in myself, I'm not excluding myself from this, but we as a culture tend to question and devalue these enchantments and, and, and even these kind of consumer enchantments and this consumer art that Wilde is getting at. Um, so what does Wilde do? Wilde theorizes enchantment, re-enchantment, how? Through, through his works of art. So he, he writes plays, he writes stories, he writes fairy tales, and through his philosophy. But, so his philosophy isn't written in philosophy books, it's written in humorous dialogues. Um, and some of those dialogues are actually in plays. So, so his stuff is, is you know, his work is, which is really great, rich intellectual work, but it's embedded in a lot of his artwork. So you got to kind of work through his plays and his uh, dialogues. Um, and he critiques this materialist disenchantment. Like another uh, current philosopher today, James K.A. Smith, uh, James K.A. Smith, professor a philosophy at uh, Calvin College in Michigan, uh, wrote a couple of books, Desiring the Kingdom and Imagining the Kingdom, where he says, what's a human being? A human being is not just a thinking being, a rational animal, like Aristotle says, but more fundamentally, a human is a desiring being, a loving being, a lover. And our desires are formed partly by our biology. Okay, I, I want food. I want, I want, I desire sex. I desire shelter. Those are biological desires. But also through culture and through these rituals of life. And so my iPhone, where's my iPhone? Um, it, it forms me. And like, I have these rituals of swiping and, 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 it's there at my beck and call, or it calls to me, um, and it and it hums and it beeps, um, and it trains me. It trains my desires so that I desire certain sneakers, or or certain films, or certain ways of consuming myself, or or even the concept of how do I fulfill myself by consuming. I'm a consumer, and there's a negative aspect of that, obviously, and I, I'm going to critique that consumerism. As, a, as an ideology is horrible. We want to, I would like us to separate us ourselves from that false vision of ourselves. However, consuming, consuming 
being a consumer is not a bad thing. That's really part of who I am in the modern world. And that's why Wilde wants to inject art into that and see that as, as a positive, or, or it's full of positive potential. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's the false consumerism where, like, I, I'm not a really fully, fully human human until I have a big car or until I have a big house, or until I'm getting like Amazon boxes every other day. That's ma that makes me human. And if I'm not getting those, then I'm not really fulfilling myself. Well, no, that's a false story. That's not, that's not the consumerism I'm defending. But I, I want to defend consuming as, as a human practice that's fundamental to who we are as modern people um, and, and as a place where beautiful, important works of art are being made including by Wilde and Tolkien. And so let me transition to Tolkien for a second, where you have Tolkien realizing existential wonder and through fantasy story. And Sam and Frodo in The Lord of the Rings they go into these elvish regions like Lothlorien and Rivendell <coughs> and they meet with the elves. And the elves are more in touch with wonder and with enchantment and, and touch the transcendent more readily than the humans. And when Sam is there, he says, I feel as if I was inside a song, if you take my meaning. And okay, I don't quite take your meaning, but when Wilde's character says something like that, you know, like, there's some philosophizing going on here. I need to sort of think about this. Um, I need to think about what does this mean? I feel as if I was inside of a song. I'm not sure if I was awake or dreaming. And so there's this liminal state where the human consciousness is more awake and open. Uh, I mean, it's almost like psychedelics. Now, I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, promoting psychedelics here. I, I'm neither for or against them, but, but we don't need them. I'm not, we can just do this with art. And, and that's what Sam is doing with, with song and with music and with story fantasy story that inspires and that opens up the world to us and Sam's feeling that I'm inside of a song like my life has been changed and if I'm inside of a song then like I'm a character in that song I'm I'm like if the song is I don't know a Beatles song about um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on, on the character um, uh, what's that song this is a song about Rocky Raccoon, like Rocky Raccoon, Rocky Raccoon checked into his room only to find Gideon's Bible, etc. So like I'm that character in that song. And so I've got a direction, I've got a meaning, I've got a story that I'm part of that's giving, that's driving me forward. I'm not stuck in this kind of flat, disenchanted, dead state. I'm alive. I'm fully alive. So that's, that's the story that Sam is in. He's enchanted. Um, and and this, uh, a critic named Patrick Curry write, writes about Tolkien's ca uh, capacity to re-enchant us, his work of re-enchantment in his works, and how, excuse me, Tolkien himself experienced this uh, in his life, in his experience. He identifies two moments in Tolkien's life when he experienced re-enchantment. One was finding this medieval text by Kinnewulf, uh, a poem called Christ by Kinnewulf, where there's this mysterious line, and the line is this. It's, Hail Earendil, brightest of angels, above the middle earth sent unto men. And so Tolkien writes about this, how he read that line, and he was just thunderstruck. And he starts to 
be inspired by that, and that becomes the beginning of a lot of his stories, which becomes the Silmarillion, which is the backstory to the Lord of the Rings, and this, this character, Arendil, who's a human, who marries an elf and has this mystical, important, heroic life. Um, and now here he becomes brightest of angels uh, in this um, line from Kenewulf, and Tolkien like, takes that line and like spins a whole story out of that, which really is the beginning of the Lord of the Rings. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other moment that Curry identifies as a moment of re-enchantment for Tolkien was his uh, wooing of his wife, Edith, and while he was home from war, uh, World War I, and he's with his wife, Edith, recently married, and they're in the woods, and she's dancing among the hemlocks in the woods in Yorkshire, in the north part of England, uh, on a, on a, while he's resting from the war because he got sick. That 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 became the beginning of the whole love story of Baron and Luthien, which is a, another key story in the Silmarillion, which is another key source for the Lord of the Rings. So. Um, so yeah, so here Tolkien, he's seeing a transcendent, uh, of a really full of meaning moment, like a moment where like, uh, like a flood of meaning. It's not just like a little bit, but like the meaning just breaks through overwhelmingly. It's wonder, it's enchantment, it's re-enchantment. Um, and so his connection to the world, his connections to others is enriched. He's not just kind of this dead man stuck in a dead place. Um, and I was going to do a song, and so um, the song is about a song. It's called Piano Man, and I don't play the piano, uh, so I'm just going to do a guitar version of it. And it's from Billy Joel. And let's see if I can play this. And look at the words here in the chords. I think I pretty much know it, but still need to look at this. Um, and it's this song about a guy who sings a song. So this is kind of a reflection that we can make in regards to what we're just saying about re-enchantment here. So let's see if I can get this there. Okay. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. A regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me Making love to his tonic engine He says, son, can you play me a memory? I'm not really sure how it goes But it's sad and it's sweet and I knew it complete when I wore a younger man's clothes. Oh, la da da. Let's see. La da 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 da. La da 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 da. Sing us a spot's pretty high. Sing us a song, y'all, the piano man. Sing us a song tonight Well, we're all in the mood for a melody And you got us feeling all right Now John at the bar is a friend of mine He gets me my drinks for free and he's quick with a joke or a light of your smoke There's some place that he'd rather be He 
says, Bill, I believe this is killing me As a smile ran away from his face Well, I'm sure that I could be a movie star If I could get out of this place Oh, la da 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 la da 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 Skip a little bit. Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. We're all in the mood for a melody, and you got us feeling all right. It's a pretty good crowd for a Saturday, and the manager gives me a smile. Cause he knows that it's me they've been coming to see To forget about life for a while And the piano it sounds like a carnival And the microphone smells like a beer And they sit at the bar and put bread in my jar And say, man, what are you doing here? Sing us a song, you're the piano man Sing us a song tonight We're all in the mood for a melody And you got us feeling all right does what he sings at nine o'clock on a Saturday and I guess let's look at these lyrics here for a second um, the lines have to do with how yeah he's presenting this song this story this work of art and uh, he, he's asked by this older guy to play a song, uh, Play Me a Memory. Um, and he sings this song and he says, sing, sing us a song. Uh, We're all in the mood for a melody and you've got us feeling all right. And so the work of art We've got this mood, we've got this desire, we've got this urge, we've got this restlessness. You know, this is this existential feeling, this phenomenon that we're all feeling at some points in our life. Um, and so philosophy is, one of its jobs is to get at that restlessness. It's not just, a, a, you know, some philosophers are just philosophies, philosophers of being, like what's real and what, what exists. But this is more than that. This is about human experience of that, of being. Um, and that restlessness that people like, like Augustine of, of Hippo would write about as a kind of driver of human life. And, uh, and so these people are there, and he's, he's um, talking about them, and uh, the guy says, Bill, I believe this is killing me. I, I, I'm sure that I could be a movie star if I could get out of this place. So he's, he's got these unfulfilled desires. He's got this yearning. He's got this restlessness there. And the song is helping him see himself <clears throat> more properly in that situation. And, and then you've got um, these other people, Paul and Davey and so forth, and the waitress and the businessman. But they're all inspired. They're all re-enchanted by this song. They're in the mood for a melody, and they're getting that melody. And the manager's happy because people are coming to see this. This is also a commercial exchange where people come and spend money. So anyway, this is another aspect of art where it is a consumer product. Um, everything is a consumer product now, and, and that's not bad or good. It's just like even like going to church, like you choose like where you go to church if you go to church. You choose what am I going to watch? What are the stories that are going to 
inspire me. And, and, and that's neither good nor bad. That's, in, in a sense, it's good. It's, it's where we've got to do art. Um, whether you're Billy Joel or Oscar Wilde, Wilde or Tolkien, uh, people are in the mood for a melody, and you got to make them feel all right. You got to, to some extent, entertain them. Now, art is not just entertaining. I mean, art that is just that is 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 pretty weak. But art is going to entertain us. Um, you know, there's some artists who like want to address just this small coterie group of people like I can write this really obscure poem uh, like or, or you know pick on somebody I, I I respect and I like um, James Joyce but like some of his writings are like so obscure and difficult to understand it's like who's gonna understand this like it's like this one percent of the population can appreciate it so okay I mean there's a certain artwork that's that way but there's a, a different type of artwork which is Oscar Wilde's and Tolkien's artwork which is to the mass audience and so it's going to be involved in consumer culture. And so that is good. Um, that's the work that you know, Tolkien and Wilde and others are doing. <coughs> and um, I mean, let me say just a brief thing about this. Maybe I can do a little whiteboard action here. Let's see. Um, where we have, um, on the one hand, you know, you have humans. And the humans can't live in enchantment all the time. Because uh, we can't. And so that le le lends a poignancy. And there's a really cool word, poignant. It's really hard to define that. but. But it's, it's a great word. Um, and let's contrast that with elves. Now, elves are not real, I know. But just the concept of elves uh, in the Tolkienian universe. And, and, and um, Wilde has something similar, because he has his own fairy stories, which we can get into another time. But elves can live in enchantment all the time. So they're in Lothlorien, or they're in Rivendell. They're experiencing song a lot. They're, they're experiencing music and artwork and creating artwork, uh, making rings and making other beautiful works of art. Um, but because of their being tied to the material world, they are experiencing the long defeat, as it's called. That Because they can't stay here. They're going to eventually have to leave. They can stay here for thousands and thousands of years. Is what That's the what Tolkien universe's story, but uh, you see this in Lord of the Rings, they're starting to leave, they've got to leave. Um, they're, they're, they're experiencing a kind of a defeat, unlike the humans. So the humans, you know, they've got the poignancy of, of, of yearning for eternity, but they can't never, they can never totally experience it here. And, but that's, even that's great, that, that because human life is so limited and, and like the haiku poets of Japan get at this like, uh, a little flower that blossoms one day and the next day dies is even more beautiful because it only lasts one day. Or even like a dewdrop on that flower that only lasts like a, a couple of hours. And like you look at that dewdrop on that flower and the sunlight coming through it on a, on a spring morning, and it's so beautiful because it's not gonna last. So, but because it's not gonna last, that moment of dewdrop beauty opens to eternity, that you see in a little drop of water the entirety of, hum of, of, of all existence. Um, and, and like if, there's a lot to be said here, but if human life exists in like historical time where it's like one moment after another and it's like you're following your watch, that's one type of time. But then there's the time that touches onto eternity. And, and that happens at certain kairos moments, at certain moments of like intense life. Uh, sometimes it's at the moment of death. Uh, sometimes it's at the moment of birth. Uh, that, that sometimes it's just a moment of beauty, like the, the dew drop on the flower that opens us to that eternity of time. So sometimes it's a song. 
you lose yourself in the song, and then you're just opened up fully. You're, you're experiencing the world most fully, most, most wonderfully. You're wondering at the world. And I'm making this argument in part against those who criticize consumer culture and, and, and see modern world, modern consumer world, commercialized world as corrupted, as in, 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 in corrupted in the way that Marx or Nietzsche or Freud analyzed it. Um, because you have, to, you have to perform and you're on a surface and you're on the superficial surface. And, and it seems like it's just all, all relativism, and all subjectivism. And there's nothing really objectively true there. Um, this is one of the critiques that people make of consumer culture, consumer art. Um, but if you recall, uh, in our last episode, um, I talked about the positive aspects of the consumer aesthetics, this consumer artwork, where there's three aspects to it. The first is that it's stylized utterance. The second is that we are, humans are symbols of their culture, and partly through conspicuously consuming. And the third part is that this artwork delves into the unconscious, into the irrational. And so the stylized utterance, so like uh, the, the, the partially faked, stylized, distorted image, whether that's through makeup or fashion or performance, that's the stylized aspect. Then there's the, the standing in symbol, symbolic relation to culture, like being a sex symbol, that's, a, that's one way of being standing in symbolic relation. Or it can be like non-sexual, it can be like Gandhi or some other um, person who stands in symbolic relation to a, a, an entire culture. So the person becomes an icon. The person becomes him or herself uh, a work of art. And that these works delve into the unconscious, these parts of our life that we might not even know our, ourselves, that, that tap into these deep inner drives that, that are part of our biology and our evolutionary history that go back millions of years. And, and these irrational drives or dri drives which are just um, not accessible to reason. And so, but they're part of what make us fully human. And, um, and so, so good. Um, and so the person, to some extent, in this consumer art world is the artist of him or herself. And morality is connect connected to taste and to style and to a cultivated type of taste. Um, and this is why ritual and stylized bodily movement is so important. Um, and, and you perform your style. And that's like, I mean, it can be in a very superficial way, like, okay, I'm a Manchester United fan, so you wear a Manchester United jersey. Or you watch the Manchester United game with a bunch of other Manchester United people, and you, and you chant the chants, and there's this kind of ritual aspect of it. Very ritualized, I mean, soccer, I mean, sports is a very rit ritualized realm, uh, domain of human activity, which makes it kind of religious, if I, I would say. Um, I think that's a good, a good way of, of describing it. Um, and, and it's also performative. So you're performing your man -ness by your style, by your fashion, by your behavior. Um, and you're performing. And performance, in that sense, is it fake? Is it just like trying to be something that you're not? You're like faking it till you make it? Um, it can be fake. But it can be real. I mean, and, and, and that part of my, my identity, that's a real part of my identity. And, and as much as other deeper parts of my identity. I mean, granted, it's not that deep of a part. But, but there are, all these things are engaged in consumer culture. They're implicated in consumer culture. They're 
partly based on consumer choices that I make, um, and that's good. That's not a bad thing. Um, this is against Marx. This is against that type of look at, at consumer culture. Or, or a positive image is like um, African American literature, like Martin Luther King Jr. and, and his, his I, I Have a Dream speech is, you know, uh, it's a consumer image that you can like put on your t-shirt and it's also, you can like watch it on YouTube, but it's connected to something real and, and a real identity for African Americans and for all Americans, um, a legacy that must be preserved. I imagine if like we lost that. I mean like that would be a huge loss to culture and to, to society. Uh, MLK or Frederick Douglass's stories or uh, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, like we need those stories and we need that tradition and we need to edu education support, we need to like educate ourselves on this material. Um, and, and yeah, and so that's, that's part of this as well. Um, and this helps us delve into the unconscious. Um, what do I need to say about that? Um, you know, uh, there are uh, the sex symbols and uh, Princess Diana or Meghan Markle or Bono <clears throat> or Ed Sheeran um, who stand in symbolic relation to our culture and help us know who we are. And so we as men and women look at those figures and it helps us figure out who we are. And we, 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 can, we can love those people. We can be fans. Uh, that's, that's a kind of consumer aspect of it. But, but fandom can go beyond just consumerism and, and it can really help us identify who I am. What's my identity as, as an American or as a British person? Uh, Queen Elizabeth's death, which happened this past year or last year, uh, affected so many people and when we saw the rituals of, of the funeral and like the march and the people getting dressed up and and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people uh, lining up to, to see that funeral procession um, and then people all over the world watching it on TV. Um, and so these are important aspects of human experience which are tied to the unconscious, which help us build our identity through performance and sometimes through consumer performance um, by what we buy and consume. And so these are positive things that we can build on to build our culture.